Hello everyone and welcome back to day two of theCUBE's live wall-to-wall -wall coverage of HPE Discover here in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host, co-analyst, Dave Vellante. We're, this, this, this show is really getting going. We're feeling the buzz down on the show floor. Fun to have Antonio on today. Exactly, he was, a great a very, interview. Very calm CEO, love it. He, it's calm but charismatic. Yep, for Indeed. sure. Well, I'd like to welcome our next two guests to the show. We have Jordan Nanos, he is machine learning architect at HPE. Welcome, Jordan. And Anayat Shaban, executive emerging technologies, corporate strategic partnerships and alliance at Paraton Inc. Welcome, Anayat. Thank you. Anayat, I want to start with you. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about Paraton Inc. and, and what you do there? Uh, yeah, so at Paraton I, I run emerging technology. What that uh, includes is running all the research and development across the corporation. So I work for a strategic innovation group where we are actually looking at research and development, the hard problems that we are solving for our customers. Uh, so that includes uh, AI, cloud, cyber, on those areas. So actually I run that across the corporation. We build solution and then take it to our customer. So that's one part of my job. The other part of my job, as uh, you explained on my title, I also run Partnership Alliance, which makes a lot of sense. So I look at, uh, go and discuss meetings with partners such as having right now in here and Discover, find solution, AIs and other emerging technology and take that and build it as part of Partner Alliance that we do across the company. Has, a, has AI always been part of the scope? Was it relatively new? Uh, How have things changed since the AI heard around the world? Uh, I would say AI has always been part of the scope. Mm -hmm. We have uh, changed a little bit of how we implement. So when we are looking at AI, as ours is more of our restricted customers. So our AI is more on uh, dedicated environment, whereas public AI, has been around long, but the private AI is where we focus on that. So I would be, I, I wouldn't say new, but it's new for our customers. That's what we are taking it. And Jordan, machine learning architect, not gen AI architect, okay? So thank you for just not jumping on the bandwagon. <laughs> but uh, we all know there's you know, AI before gen AI, but, but do you think about uh, gen AI in sort of separate domains with, for separate use cases, or is that actually part of your scope? Yes, separate use cases for sure. Um, over time we've seen an evolution in terms of what data people are using to power their AI applications. And I think generative AI is just an evolution of things that we've already been seeing. When I started working on AI, we were focused on things like recommendation systems, computer vision, and now people want to do things like chat with their data. They want productivity focused use cases in language. And uh, that's, that's where generative AI really comes in. So when you think about the private AI announcements you made this week, uh, tell us more about those, how they fit into what you just said, what's different around between private AI and public AI, let's yeah. get into that. So really, it breaks down in terms of quality, so the quality of an AI application is really powered by the data set that you're using, and many of the organizations that we work with, like Periton, are you know, really focused on confidential or private or regulated data sources to power their AI applications. So we believe, you know, just like in the space of cloud, AI is just going to be hybrid. There's going to be use cases that are public, there's going to be use cases that are private, and that's really based on the data set that's powering the application itself. And you know, is that a yeah. function, is the decision point a function of, of, of locality? Uh, you know, physical locality of the data, or is it, uh, are there other factors involved? Oh, uh, data gravity, locality, yeah. definitely as an important aspect of it. So you talked about uh, public AI, right? So we do want to use public AI, but data sovereignty comes in place, data gravity, locality of how we want to do. Um, a lot of implementation has happened in public data. We want to bring that, do it in AI or a hybrid implementation, but we need, we need to look at the data, how we can implement that in a private sense. So locale is important. Not just from a, a gen, gen AI, but also massive amount of data that are existing that we need to consider that. You know, I wonder if we can draw um, comparisons between cloud, because cloud's in your title, right. and what's happening with AI. I have said, Companies like HPE, you were HP at the time, you were, you're not alone, uh, and others, they were way late to cloud. They just right. focused on private cloud, the experience wasn't this. They finally, when they embraced hybrid, and then, then when GreenLake came out, right. that kind of set a new standard. Yeah. I was like, okay, it's about time. <laughs> but you gave the cloud guys a long, long time to, to get a leap. Not happening 
with AI. Right. So, my question is, what do you need from the companies like HPE to be comfortable that you don't have to go to the cloud, that actually if you have data locally with data gravity, you, you can keep the data where it is, you can bring the AI to the data. What do you need from them? What's that experience and what are the, what's the portfolio and the partnerships need to look like for you as a technologist yeah. to be comfortable? Uh, so we have actually worked long with HP hybrid cloud and um, one of many of my conversation has been with HP executives, the private cloud is the need. That's what my customer is looking for. Yeah, again, I said hybrid cloud, but private cloud is where we're looking. What we are looking for is have that AI as part of, uh, if you say GreenLake or Flex that we have, that HP has, that needs to be part of it, that is a package. I don't think you can separate the infrastructure from AI. You need the data, you need the infrastructure, you need the GPUs, so all of those comes in and combined. So what we are looking for from HP, if, a, a comprehensive solution, starting with the cloud, whether it's hybrid, private, with the data, and then taking that to a dedicated environment, to a tethered environment, to a local or to a uh, more restricted area. Is it fair to say then that the security, the privacy, uh, the performance of your private cloud mm -hmm. is more important than the consistency of experience between that that private cloud and the public cloud, the so-called hybrid. Is that, we're, we're, is that latter less important or are they both like really we're important? We're a cyber company, so the answer is clear. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. That is important. I mean, yeah. Most of our customers are cyber customers, cyber and space. So yeah, the cyber, the, the data sovereignty is important to us, data privacy. Uh, and there's a lot of data that not publicly available. We, we have access to data, and so those are data that we need to look at. So yeah, security. You prioritize security. that first over, over. over some interface or developer uh, absolutely. experience. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so last year was, was about training, and we right. saw a huge build out in GPU capacity as the success of NVIDIA can, yeah. can demonstrate vividly to all of us. What do you see as in store for this year and, and even in the future? So I think this year is the really the year of inference in the enterprise, which means that we've seen uh, really impactful releases of uh, public free open source models that many organizations can download and use for their business applications. And that means that there's now a requirement for GPUs and accelerated compute to be all over the world, where the data is being created. Our CEO, Antonio, talks about bringing the compute to the data, data rather than bringing the data to the compute. And I think this is particularly important when we look at AI applications because there's data sets that you don't want to share that are not public. This could be your code re repository. This could be product documentation about things you haven't released yet. Uh, this could be confidential communications with third parties. You don't want to release that data into the public domain and really bringing you know, GPUs into the data center, onto a, a mobile device, onto a ship, onto a you know, armored vehicle, onto a drone. There's all sorts of different use cases where when you bring compute to the data, you're able to unlock a lot of new experiences for people. I, I, I want to add on to inference. I think that is important. I mean, I think we, 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 we build the data, we train them, we fine tune them, I, I then we will continue to do fine tuning. But the inference is the most important right now. Uh, there are many examples. AV cars, right? Well, you can train them on a stop sign, but they will stop somewhere. What happens if there is no stop sign? Still, the reference implementation will help it to stop. It, it understands that, right? On fraud prevention, we do a lot of fraud prevention. Uh, we do a lot of uh, cybersecurity maldetection, right? Well, I cannot teach. I cannot train about all the malware that comes in. Well, inference comes in play. I think that is going to be, absolutely yeah. agree with uh, Jordan, that is the next thing. That is what everybody's going to focus on. How we can fine tune it so we get more advanced on inferences. Do you need GPUs to do that <laughs> inference? Uh, we, do, we need GPUs in everywhere, yes. Because we somebody said to me recently, because a lot of talk about whether or not you need GPUs to do inference. I'd love your, your expert opinion on this. Somebody recently said to me, look, it's matrix math, but there's a lot of it. Right. And so you're yeah. actually going to need sort so, of GPUs at the edge doing those. Others have said, 
Not necessarily, so I'm curious from your perspective. I, go ahead. Yeah, so it, it depends what type of experience you're trying to create. I think if you look at some of these applications, uh, people expect that there's just one model powering it, mm -hmm. and in fact there's, applications where there's going to be multiple models, and some are going to be a good fit for accelerated compute, and others potentially not. So let's give an example where you're running a, a model on a ship that's disconnected, doesn't have access to the internet, but you still want users on the ship to effectively have a, a personal assistant where they can chat with a manual. Instead of 500 pages of details, they can quickly get a response and learn about some detail of the machine they're working on. If a user is trying to speak their native language, we could involve a model to transcribe the audio to text, to translate the text, to then do a retrieval of the relevant documents, then form a chat response, translate it back, and uh, potentially take the text to speech back to the user to give them an audio experience. That's six models, right? Some of them are potentially required to run on a GPU because they're so big. Others can, you can quickly short circuit it, uh, run it on the CPU that you already have. But I think more and more we're going to see um, these models be optimized for specific processors. CPU is good for general processing. The GPU is very good for specific stuff, right? Yeah, well, I was in another another panel, Northern Virginia Technology Council, and one of the questions regarding the GPU was, so what is the challenge? And I, I know we haven't talked about this, the supply chain on GPU. There is impossible amount of requests that we are getting right now that the industry can provide amount of GPU. Uh, it's just, and again, it's not just restricted, public. I know there was an announcement that we have done enough GPU, I don't think we have. I think that would be the biggest thing. Your question is, do we need GPU? I think we need more of it. How are we going to meet that supply demand or supply chain? I'd like to hear from HP and others, how or NVIDIA, what they are providing. I'm sure you have seen from, heard from Jensen, but that's not enough amount of um, AI development we, do, we are doing. Just to put a finer point on it, so you're saying you need GPUs even for inference. That's right. So that's, that's, that's consistent with what the hardcore geeks are telling me. <laughs> um, well, I got the, a geek and, right and here. The, <laughs> and, the, and the second thing is, and, and right, confirms Jordan as well. And the second thing is, I mean, supply at some point is going to loosen up. I mean, I think Antonio on the call said um, HPE's supply is going to come under, I think he said six to 10 weeks. I can't remember the exact, don't, right. don't hold me to that. My information suggests that we're closer to you know, four to five weeks now. So it's, right. but that's for H100s. Now everybody's going to want Blackwell. That's right. right? So it's like, we Poor need Robin. bigger GPUs, yeah. as, as he says, so we'll yeah. see. Yeah. I'm interested in both of your take on the implications for the workforce, and not just the hardcore geeks. Thinking about the employees that, ha that, are, that are chatting with the data. That's why we make such a good team. That's here. right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, the, the, the person you talked about, on the ship, yeah. who is trying to, to uh, figure out a problem that is obviously imminent, and, and, and that person needs to, to, to be able to interact with the data in meaningful ways and, and in urgent ways. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of skills that you foresee being the most important skills even for the non-hardcore geeks, for the well, people who are, whose job it is to, to chat with the data and interact with the data. Well, I, I, I don't know, maybe you have insight to our research and development that we do. So one of the things that we are looking at is what we call as debaters and uh, judges, right? So we, uh, prompt engineers. You're talking about prompt engineers. How are you going to make use of the, all these LLMs and Gen AI that we have? So what we build is a, a system, this is in prototype and I can talk a little bit about that. We basically build debaters. Debaters asking questions from chat GPT or whatever your favorite uh, tool is. You ask the same questions and you get response. And then you have the judge take the response and send it back. And guess what, the response that the judge get is closer to that number than what the prompters, each debaters are getting. So there, there are ways, uh, I think, and when, when you're talking about uh, workforce, I think we work very closely with a lot of universities. Data science, you know, and every university is increasing amount of data, so we want to bring in a lot of young generation into our company, and I think that is where we're talking about how we can make better use of, um, I, I don't want to be the one, one person saying responsible AI, right? So that's the challenge of how we can address that. Yeah, I think, so for the example of chat with the data, 
I have yet to see an example of an LLM powered application where you're just replacing an absolute expert in the domain. But what we're seeing is the ability to create new, really productive people really quickly. So I think training and learning is a really powerful way in which these models can be used. I particularly focus with customers on internal use cases versus external. If you're focused on internal productivity things, you remove a lot of the risks of AI or generative AI. A hallucination means a confused developer or a confused new employee who's trying to learn. It's not really a risk to the reputation of the business, but if you put this on your website and it's public, there's a lot of differences in terms of that experience. So I think most organizations that I'm seeing be successful with generative AI are starting with internal productivity focused use cases right. and they're getting a lot of value from that. Where there's a real human in the loop all the time. Yeah. Well, so bringing together Rebecca's point about you know, the human impact and the technology impact, uh, we, we often say, well, we're in the early days of, of AI. It's like the dial-up days of, of the internet, you know. <laughs> um, and so, that, that, you can only imagine what it's going to be like in the future, but I love using LLMs because it, it saves a lot of time, makes you more productive, but what I find myself doing now, to the exact point you were saying, is you, 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 because of the hallucinations, I'll have ChatGPT open, I'll have Perplexity open, I'll, yeah. have, I'll go to Meta AI for Llama, I'll do Gemini, I literally have four tabs open. You're the I'll best ask the engineer. exact same question of each, and then I will use my human intuition to say, I think that's the right answer. And I might even Google it. Or take it, a little bit you know? of both and, and, and really and, and I, might, I might even Google it just to check, you know, fact check. So yeah. it has made my fact checking, maybe not, I guess more productive, I think probably more accurate. So my question is, are we going to get to the point where I can interact with these multiple models simultaneously and get a higher quality answer. Yeah, I think absolutely, yeah. The, so, relying in, on your intuition I think is really important. The big thing I've seen when rolling out these generative AI applications is that you actually need to train users to operate in this world of uncertainty where it's not a deterministic response, you don't know it's going to be exactly yeah. right. You need to check the sources, you need to verify things. And that's a, that's, that's a big change in how people operate and, and interact with technology. But I'm, I'm really surprised by how easy it seems for people to work this way because it's a more human experience. It's, it's actually more strange to get a, an exact response that's deterministic from a Google search or you're checking a web page than it is to basically hear from a friend. And you know sometimes they're just making stuff up. Right? <laughs> okay, um, my last question is, I wrote a piece recently on hybrid AI and I got a lot of grief for it. Well, that's hybrid AI. Sounds like a marketing term. Well, maybe it is. Oh, I so hope you didn't say, hey, hybrid AI is dead. No, gosh, no. Because uh, there no, was an uh, article, the, so is dead, about no, 10 years ago. So. The, the opposite, actually. Okay. I said hybrid AI is actually a thing. I also said super cloud is a thing and I got a lot of grief for that, but <laughs> I, I, we defined it, you know, and, and so anyway. Um, what's your point of view on, on, on hybrid AI? How do you, how do you de maybe define it or think about what it actually is? Is it real? Is hybrid AI a thing? It, it is, and you can take advantage of that. So, as, and again, in my case, and that's true for a lot of things, you could use the public AI to get a lot of information, gather that information, and then go to the private side of it where I'm focusing on data sovereignty. I cannot handle data sovereignty in public data. Right, yeah. so we're, we're locale, or data gravity when I'm going to private and I want to have that locale data for me. So I think there's definitely a big play for hybrid. I, I don't think, hopefully we're not going to do the same thing that we talked about hybrid cloud, it's only hybrid cloud, it's only public cloud. Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. hear all these, <laughs> everything will go public cloud. I have a lot of customers coming back to like, uh, what happened to that private cloud you were talking to me about 10 years ago? I, I don't want to be in that position. I think it, there's going to be a combination of both. It's that but, mixture of data sources yeah, that you're but saying. Yeah, but it depends on, on, on the customers and uh, how, who are looking and, you know, most of my customers are looking on private AI. Mm. But definitely I need to take advantage of public AI because there is so much I can learn from that and take that and use it on a private setting. Anything you'd add? I think just to focus on locality, like you were saying, so right. um, the distinction between public and private I think is important, but there's also real examples of a model that can run on your phone or your laptop compared to a model that can run in a data center, which could be you know, in your metro region or it could be quite far away from you. We've seen this with autonomous vehicles, there's models that run on the car, there's models that run in a data center, and I think that's going to be 
uh, the biggest driver for the reason people adopt a hybrid approach. Um, generally, when people bring up hybrid cloud, hybrid AI, it seems to me that they're making the point that the world is complicated, and so, Sorry. yeah, cloud is complicated, AI is complicated, you're going to need to contend with that, and there's going to be things that need to run locally and remotely. You know, Jensen at GTC, we had a private meeting with him, a bunch of analysts, and he said something that really resonated with me, because we're so used to getting instantaneous responses, and sometimes those instantaneous responses are just meh. He said, you know, what if you could tell the AI, go solve this problem, I got, $5,000 to spend, go reason, take the time, take two weeks yeah. and go reason and then come back with an answer in two weeks. He goes, that is the future that he laid out, which I, I thought was quite interesting. You would do that, you know, that's different sort of thinking than the instantaneous response, the instant gratification. So yeah, it is early days. Well, we, we talked about this year being the year of inference, certainly for the models that are already trained, but there are large organizations training absolutely massive models. And if you think about like a 10 trillion parameter dense model, I mean, how long is it going to take to get just one token out of that thing? It, clearly there, there's a, a need for batch inference use cases where this is going to be really high quality, but it's going to take a long time to get a response. And then there's also going to be a need for smaller models to give you a near instantaneous response. Lots of training, even more inference. And, yeah, and it's yeah. complicated. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think you ask uh, regarding like the human going to be in, in the loop. I think in a lot of cases, it will be on the loop. It has to be on the loop. We All cannot right. Our rely. jobs are secure. Exactly. Naya and Jordan, thank you both secure. so much for coming on the show. Maybe. A great conversation. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.